my research at Answers in Genesis is focused on creation microbiology and specifically dealing with the genetics of microbes. And I really like that because it's a perfect combination since I've been professionally trained as a molecular geneticist, which is what I have my PhD in, but I also taught microbiology for six years at the college level and really developed um, kind of a love, so to speak. I said if I ever wanted to go back and get another PhD, which I'm not going to, but if I did, um, it would be in microbiology because I really like studying about microbes, the little things that God created, has created. Now, what is a microbe? Well, a micro is, is an organism that cannot be readily seen by the naked eye. So it is microscopic in nature. And there's several different organisms that fall into the category of microbe. We have bacteria, algae, fungi, protists, and viruses. All of those fall into the category of microbes. And so you see some pictures here uh, of those different organisms. Now, we're not going to have time to go in any kind of detail on all of these. We're specifically going to focus on bacteria because that's what what my main research is and what I look at. And I think that these are some of the most overlooked organisms that God has created, and yet they're a very active and important part of God's creation. In fact, the livelihood of every other organism on this planet depends on these small creatures. So let's talk about some fascinating facts, because I like to do those. I like to find out neat facts about organisms when I'm studying them. And uh, the number of bacteria on Earth is estimated to be 10 to the 30th. Now, that sounds like, you know, you think, okay, well, what does that mean? Well, let's just say the stars in the universe are only 10 to the 22nd. So there are more bacteria on Earth at this very moment than there are stars in the universe. Bacteria rule, you know? Yay. Um, <laughs> So, and there are 9,000 species of bacteria known. Now, again, that may seem like a lot, but we think that there are possibly 10 million species out there. It's just they're very picky about how they grow and the conditions that they grow in, so we can't always grow them in the lab. But we knew, do know about some of them through uh, the DNA that we can look at. And one gram of topsoil has in it 10 billion bacteria, 100,000 fungi, and 25,000 algae. And that's why topsoil is so rich, because it has all these microorganisms in it. Now, the reason that we can have so many of them on the Earth, and yet them, so to speak, not take over, is because they're very, very, very small. And their size, on average, ranges from 3 to 5 microns. Now, what is a micron? A micron is 1 25,000th of an inch. So think about it this way. Human hair is about 30 to 121 microns. These are much smaller than the thickness of hair, okay? Much, much smaller. So only three to five microns. But some of them, you know, that's the average size, but they can actually get very, very big or very, very small. Uh, Thiomargarita is the largest known bacteria at this point at 750 micron. It is visible to the naked eye. And now, we still consider it a microbe because it's a bacteria, but nonetheless, you actually do not need a microscope to see these bacteria. They're so large. And then we have on the opposite end, we have mycoplasma. Mycoplasma are only 0.3 microns big. And in fact, you could take 2,500 of those and fit them into one thiomargarita. Okay, so they're very, very, um, there's a very big range, so to speak, but the average is about three to five microns. Now, they come in some amazing shapes. You know, when we think about bacteria, a lot of people think, okay, um, a circle, okay, what we call a cosi, or a bacilli, which is a rod, or a spirilli, which is a spiral. Those are the three basic shapes that most people learn about in school, but they come in some pretty cool shape, like this triangular-shaped one, or this, um, I don't know what you call this, but some sort of just a very different um, kind of, um, pleom we call pleomorphic bacteria, um, a square. Bacteria come in squares sometimes, uh, depending on their environment, and it can even be shaped like a star. So very, very different. Now, these live in some pretty extreme environments. This one here is pleomorphic. It has lots of different shapes on it. Uh, so just some amazing shapes. And when we think about bacteria, one of the things we probably commonly associate, that, associate with bacteria is what about us, bacteria in association 
with us. And not only as those that cause disease and problems for us, but also those that are part of our microbiota. Now, what do we mean by that? Those are the bacteria that live on us and in us that really help us out, that we couldn't really survive without. Uh, a really hot topic, at least in today's um, world, is probiotics. Maybe you've heard that terminology before. Uh, you'll hear uh, they talk about certain brands of yogurt and how you can get digestive health, you know, if you eat these. What you're eating is living cultures of bacteria. Yum. Uh, and uh, they will... <laughs> help you out, so to speak, in your digestive health. Because a lot of times problems with the intestinal system come from not having enough good bacteria there. So these are the good guys. Total bacteria on or in human beings at any given point is anywhere from 10 to 100 trillion individual bacterial cells. Now, you only have 10 trillion human cells. So you're more bacteria than human. Uh, you <laughs> You actually have more bacterial cells on or in your body than you, than you do human cells. They outnumber you, so to speak. Uh, the human GI tract has about 5,000 species of bacteria, 5,000. Um, and they're still finding more and more of these. On the surface of your skin, think about this when you shake hands with someone. On the surface of your skin, there are 10,000 uh, sorry, yeah, 10,000 bacteria per square centimeter per square centimeter. Now, underneath your skin, on the inner surface, there are one million bacteria per square centimeter. And when I was reading up on this, you know, people were like really surprised. They thought there'd be more on the outside than the inside. But again, one of the main roles of these good bacteria is to survive there so the bad bacteria can't. And skin is a major way that bacteria can get in, and so we need that protection there. Um, now, bacteria not only live on and in us, but they also live in some pretty extreme environments. So we'll take you to the other extreme now. Um, and these bacteria are called archaea. Uh, they're, very, they're somewhat different from the traditional bacteria that we talk about because they live in such extreme environments. One is called Geothermobacterium very reducens. Whew, love these names. It thrives at the boiling point of water. It thrives at 212 degrees Fahrenheit, where you think nothing could live but this bacteria can. Uh, here's another bacteria, Haloarchaea. This thrives in extreme salinity, up to 36% salt. That is almost the saturation point of water, okay, for salt. Uh, and these bacteria tend to be square, very square-shaped, because of the very salty environment that they live in. You see these a lot in the salt evaporation ponds. Maybe if you've flown over those before, they have really pretty colors to them. A lot of those colors are due to these bacteria that live there. Uh, another one, so they can also live in the extreme cold, Saccharomonas here, that thrives at 10 degrees Fahrenheit, okay? That's below the freezing point of water, and it's possible that they can survive in even colder temperatures. Uh, if there's enough uh, salt, so to speak, in the environment, that the freezing temperature lowers, and so they can actually thrive in some pretty cold conditions. Claiming Demonis nivalis. Now, this is an algae, but I just had to throw this in because I thought it was really neat when I ran across it. It is responsible for something called snow algae. Okay? It is snow algae, and it produces watermelon snow. Now, whatever you do, don't eat the pink snow. <laughs> it's not a good idea, but it actually, apparently, you find it a lot in the mountain ranges, and when you pick it up, it smells like watermelon. Uh, and looks like watermelon. It's very pink, and you can see that in the picture there. But these things can grow anywhere. I mean, they can even grow in snow. Uh, Picrophilus uh, here, it thrives at an acidic pH of 0.7, which is equivalent to battery acid. And you find this a lot in acid mine drainage. So bacteria can survive almost anywhere. It doesn't matter where you go, they survive. They survive in the depths of the, of the earth, and they survive in the air. I mean, they can just survive anywhere. So that's just to give you some kind of cool background on microbes to help you really appreciate um, these organisms a little bit and all the amazing things and some amazing things associated with them. Now, we have to ask our question, ourselves a question, though. On what day did God create microbes? Because... I know it doesn't talk about microbes in Genesis, okay? The creation of microbes isn't discussed anywhere in the Bible. I think it'd be really nice if, if it did, but it doesn't. 
And so how do we determine then, because they are something that God created, they are living organisms, they are very important, so how do we determine on what day or days microbes were created? And in order to do that, we first have to understand something about their lifestyle. And microbes are classified as either free living or symbiotic. So the symbiotic means they're in association with us or with an animal or with a, a plant. They're in association with something else or they're just living out there in the soil, free living. Free living ones are important in nutrient cycling and decomposing waste. And the symbiotic ones, again, with humans, animals, and plants, give varying benefits to the host. It depends on the relationship you're talking about, um, what they do, and, and how um, we help them and they help us, so to speak. So there's, there's two basic classifications there. Now, um, what, we, what I think, and what several other creation microbiologists think, is that microbes were created on multiple days of creation. It wasn't just one day. And Dr. Alan Gillen, who is a professor and microbiologist at Liberty University, um, he came to a meeting that we hosted at Answers in Genesis uh, two years ago now. It was called Microbe Forum, and we brought in creation microbiologists around the country. And we had discussions for four days on various research that we were doing, and this is one of the topics that came up. And Dr. Gillen decided to actually write a paper on this, uh, synthesizing some of what we talked about and his own ideas on the topic. And he actually um, wrote a paper, and it was published in Answers Research Journal, which is our online technical journal, talking about this. And uh, these were some of his ideas on this, and again, those of our group. In fact, we're having another microbe forum next Tuesday. Um, so I'm gearing up for that, um, and again, talking about the research that we're doing. On day three, it's likely that free-living bacteria were created along with those that were symbiotic with plants because the, one of the points of day three is to make the world habitable for animals and for humans. And so bacteria, especially the, the ones that are photosynthetic, um, that can do the same things that plants can do, they would be very important in making oxygen, which is something we need to breathe. So it's likely those and those that would be in relationship to the plants. On day five, those that were symbiotic with sea and flying creatures. And on day six, those that were symbiotic with animals and humans. There would be no point in having the bacteria if it wasn't the organism around that they were to have an association with. So it's likely, now, now we can't say this for sure, right? This is a model that we have developed, that Dr. Gillen has developed, and we need to look at this further. But this is, gives us some idea of possibly when these bacteria were created. And he had a table in his paper, which I show here, and he gives um, specific examples of bacteria that might have been created on the individual days, again, based on their, their lifestyle, so to speak. So even though they're not specifically mentioned in the Bible, we know that all living things were created during creation week, including microbes, and would need to be because of their importance in the environment and in their symbiotic relationships. Now, let's talk about the role, though, of microbes. Uh, microbes were part, like I said, and like we've established, of God's very good creation. None were pathogenic before the fall. They didn't have to worry about bacterial infections that we're commonly plagued with today. Um, pathogenic means disease-causing. They just didn't have those. They weren't there. They weren't part of God's original creation. And, you know, I think bacteria really get a bad rap. They really do. Uh, only about 5 to 10 percent of them actually cause disease. And, in fact, that number is probably, that percentage is probably a lot less, but we just don't know about all the bacteria that are out there. So at, probably at the most, 5 to 10 percent, which means that 90 to 95 percent of them still perform many of their original created roles. Even though we don't hear about them as much, they're very, very important. And um, one of the terms that we've kind of come up with or that um, we've decided on for this is that microbes were created as an organo substrate. And that's kind of a big word, and we're going to talk about that. Dr. Joseph Francis, who is an um, uh, immunologist and also deals with microbiology at um, the Master's College out in California, he actually um, wrote about this and first coined this term several years ago um, when he pre uh, pre presented a paper at the International Conference on Creationism in 2005. And here's how he defined the organosubstrate, a link between macroorganisms like plants and animals and humans and a chemically rich but inert physical environment to provide a substrate upon which multicellular creatures can thrive and persist in intricately designed ecosystems. So it's like a connection between the, the physical environment and us. Okay? That's, what, that's what the microbes are doing. 
Viewed in this context, microbes and viruses could also be thought of as a single complex massive, multicellular, multi-taxon organism with incredible and powerful life-supporting properties. We need them. We need them very much. Um, plants need them. Animals need them. And um, as a connection between our physical environment that's kind of inert and us, and that they are allowing us to draw things from the physical environment and recycling things to it and serving as kind of a mediator, so to speak, between the two. And um, what Dr. Francis does in his paper is he goes on to highlight several categories in which microbes were designed to fulfill specific roles and then gives us evidence to support that. And so we're going to go through just a couple of those categories here, they're designed to form symbiotic microbial communities. Bacteria don't just live alone out there. They live with other bacteria and algae and fungi. They form what are called biofilms, which are organized, dynamic community of microbes. Uh, they, they adhere to living or inner surfaces or typically attached to something. And uh, just to show you a picture here of biofilms, because this might be kind of a new term for you. Uh, here we go. Biofilm formation. So uh, you get bacteria adhering to some sort of surface, and then as you progress throughout um, hours or days, more bacteria join them, and eventually you get this kind of conglomeration of, could be bacteria, fungi, algae, could be lots of different things. It's like a little miniature society. They all do something different. All of us in this, all of us in this, the town of Cincinnati, and we have different roles. Some people, um, you know, clean houses. Some people speak for answers in Genesis. Some people are doctors, you know, medical doctors. They all do different things. And that's like this little community of bacteria. They all do something different. And, they, and what they've decided, because if they do this, they survive better. They survive a lot better than they would just by themselves. Now, a lot of people associate biofilms with really bad things. Like, for example, this. This is a picture of dental plaque. I mean, we don't like that. Um, but it grows on your teeth um, and causes you to have cavities. That's a biofilm. Or if you have a pipe that looks like this on the inside, that has all that yucky, slimy stuff, that is a biofilm that's come on there, and it corrodes pipes, it clogs them. Yes, they can be very problematic, but I don't have any doubt that biofilms were probably around uh, before the fall because they can do also some very good things, not just bad things. They serve as food for aquatic invertebrates. They eat them. Um, they, they're, very, they're symbiotic on plant roots. Some of those are actual biofilms that they form on the plant root. So they have very good roles and would seem to be a part of God's very good original creation. And in fact, some of them nowadays can even be used in bioremediation. If you need to clean up an oil spill, or you need to clean up um, sewage treatment, you know, they can be utilized actually to do that. So we have to get out of that mindset that, they are, that they're, they're bad. You know, in some ways, they're actually very good. And this community that they form is very complex. It's not just a blob, okay, of bacteria and other stuff. Uh, it's actually, this is showing uh, interactions in a biofilm of dental plaque on your teeth. Uh, this is what's happening, imagine that. <laughs> You've got all these bacteria here, which are the inside the circles here with the red and the blue, and all these arrows and connections are showing how they're talking to one another, um, how they're signaling to one another, how they're communicating with each other to do different things at different times to help them deal with different things uh, so they can respond to their environment and, um, and do what they do there. We may not like the outcome of that, but um, it's a very organized community community of microorganisms. So again, very, looking very highly designed. It is, they're designed to form symbiosis with macroorganisms like plants and animals and humans. Plants, probably the most common one that you hear about is rhizobium. You see this a lot with legumes like peanuts and beans. Uh, on the root, uh, the little root hairs that are here, the bacteria will actually invade those, the rhizobium, and then um, actually live inside this plant root in these little nodules that you see here and help the plant fix nitrogen to get nitrogen from its environment. Uh, we think about this in association with humans, our intestinal flora, okay, the bacteria that are in our guts. Uh, they aid in digestion, they aid in vitamin production, and they help our immune system be ready to go when the bad guys come. And on our skin, this is showing some bacteria on the skin surface here, they prevent the growth of the bad bacteria. You want the good bacteria to grow. Yeah, you do want some bacteria. You don't want to live in a sterile world. That would be a bad thing. You want bacteria, but you want the good ones to grow so that the bad ones can't. 
They're designed to free elements from the inorganic world. Again, how do they deal with that physical environment? Because there's stuff out there that we need in our bodies. Somehow we gotta get it. Well, microbes make it available to us. They extract elements from minerals and rocks, things like phosphorus and sulfur. Those are really important for the formation of DNA, for the formation of proteins. We need that. We got it. We can't take a rock. That's not gonna help us, right? <laughs> can't eat a rock. Um, so you have to get it somehow. And these bacteria help us to be able to do that that. Uh, they extract elements from atmospheric gases, especially nitrogen. They are the primary supplier of nitrogen. It's a major way that we get that, and we need that. Um, and they transfer nutrients within ecosystems. So they have a big role, again, in connecting that physical environment to us, so to serve as a mediator, basically, between the two. Now, the last category is that they're designed to cycle elements in the biological world. They're important in carbon, nitrogen, and sulfur cycles, just to name a few. Uh, every time you see a little yellow shaded region here, it means a role that bacteria have in that particular cycle, sulfur cycle especially. They're very, very active in recycling that. And again, we need that for some of our proteins. So it's important that, they, that they're, they're capable of doing this. And so that's why Dr. Francis has coined the term organosubstrate. They're interacting with the, the, the physical world and, so to speak, the organic world um, that we we have in, in human beings. They're serving as a substrate between the two. So what we've done so far is that we've looked at microbes starting with God's word as truth and creation, about when they were created, um, what they were created for, some of the roles that they had. There's originally very good roles that they still have today and a little bit about what has happened to them since the fall. We're gonna get more into that later, um, that some of them are pathogenic now and do cause disease. But what about when we start with man's ideas as truth? What about when we start with uh, the idea of evolution? And what we see is that evolution and bacteria are very intimately associated and talked about a lot. Um, bacteria are often used as a model organism for evolutionary biology. I mean often. And uh, I talked a little bit about that the other day. Why? Well, they're easy and inexpensive to culture. Why do a lot of people study bacteria? Because they're cheap. Um, they're easy to grow. They have a small genome. The, the amount of DNA they have is very, very small. So it's easier to study, not like our three billion bases. They're single cells. You only got to deal with one cell, right? Not lots multicellular like human beings are. And then they have very short generation times. You know, give them 20 minutes, they'll produce offspring <laughs> um, in some cases. It doesn't take a long time, and they can make lots of offspring. So I would set up bacterial cultures in the lab, come in the next day. You know, I'd maybe start off with, you know, maybe a few hundred bacteria, and by the next day, I've had hundreds of thousands of bacteria. So it's very, it can happen quick. They can generate large populations. Now, there's one more reason that's particularly important when we talk about evolution in bacteria, and that's the effects of mutation and natural selection are readily observed in bacteria, and that's one of the main reasons that they are utilized. And we're going to talk more about that in a minute and see and um, see uh, uh, talk about that, talk about the effects of that. So. Again, it's assumed that mutations and natural selection are the driving forces for molecules to man evolution. So it makes sense that to them, that if you can study the mutations and natural selection really easily in bacteria, then that's great, then that's what you want to study. And you're going to take that then and apply that. So whatever happens here in these bacteria, and we can study that and learn that, well, then that must also apply to plants and animals and humans. And this is just an easy and inexpensive way to do this. Um, it's a much smaller uh, model organism to work with that'll help us understand molecules to man evolution. Well, are bacteria an appropriate model for evolutionary biology? Is this valid? Can we learn about bacteria, or can we apply what we learn about bacteria to plants and animals and humans in the past and in the present? Can we understand how mutations and natural selection then lead from one kind of animal into another? Because that's what, that's what they would have us believe has happened. The answer is absolutely not. They are not good models for evolutionary biology. They're not good model organisms to study. They are the most overused and abused organism when it comes to this area. And um, we're gonna talk about some, some reasons why that's the case. You know, bacteria are amazing organisms and we can learn amazing things. We can learn about the role of mutation and natural selection. That's one of the things I study, but how it leads to adaptation, changes within a kind, changes within the bacteria, not one organism to another organism, not bacteria to a fish, okay? 
totally different thing that we're talking about here is what we can learn. Well, why is it that bacteria are really not a good model for um, evolutionary biology? Well, one, we're gonna talk about three different reasons. One of those is that bacteria are very different from plants, animals, and humans. Now, that should be obvious, right? Um, they're very different organisms, but we're gonna bring out and talk about some of those and how mutation and natural selection, what happens with bacteria, really doesn't apply to other organisms. We're also gonna talk about something called adaptive mutations, which is an active area of research for me, and um, we'll talk about that. You may not know what that is right now, but you will. And then the diversity of the pan genome, and you think, oh no, that's a big word. Uh, we'll talk about it, okay? You'll understand what it means here in a little bit, uh, because these three factors are very important important in helping us understand that they just don't work as models for evolution. Well, let's talk about bacteria versus plants and animals and humans. And the fancy science word that we give to bacteria is prokaryotes. And plants, animals, and humans, as well as protozoan, fall under the category of eukaryotes. And so let's talk about some of the differences. Well, prokaryotes don't have a nucleus, but eukaryotes do. That's actually how they get the name prokaryote and eukaryote. Um, eukaryotes do. Uh, prokaryotes don't have organelles. They don't have mitochondria. Um, they don't have a lot of the little structures, kind of little organelles that we have inside of our cells. Uh, prokaryotes typically have a cell wall. And this doesn't ap apply bar none, okay? Uh, there's always exceptions, so to speak. Um, but prokaryotes uh, do have a cell wall. Most eukaryotes do not, except for plants. Plants do, and there are a few other organisms that do, but for the most part, eukaryotes don't. Prokaryotes are, or, yeah, prokaryotes are unicellular, eukaryotes are multicellular. Again, for the most part, there are protozoans which are unicellular. And prokaryotes have a circular chromosome, and eukaryotes have a linear chromosome. Um, so that's another difference. And prokaryotes have asexual production typically. They don't need a mate, whereas eukaryotes typically need a mate. They have a lot of sexual reproduction that occurs there. So as you can see, just right off the bat, hey, they're very, very different organisms. So when we talk about the effects of mutation and natural selection, they're also very different. So let's take a look at some of these things, and these are just some to some. What about the effects of mutations within the genome? It differs depending on whether it's a prokaryote or a eukaryote. When eukaryotes have a mutation that occurs, we'll just talk about humans because that's what, it's easier to refer to yourself, um, mutations have multiple broad-ranging effects. Um, and that is because our genome is has layers upon layers upon layers of information. So when you have a mutation, it not only affects that gene or that part right there, it might affect the regulation of this gene. It might affect the way the chromosome folds. It might affect a lot of things because there's just so much information um, in there, so, so many layers of it, so to speak. Prokaryotes just do not have that kind of organization to their DNA. It's not layer upon layer of information. Um, and when, so when they have a mutation, it has one effect. Just one thing happens. Just one change happens. And so it's much more beneficial then for them to do those kinds of changes than it would be for us because we affect multiple things, not just one thing. And that's really great for bacteria because they need genetic flexibility. And we're going to talk about that a lot throughout our time here. They need the ability to change. And they have that. And this is one way that they have that. Another one is their population sizes and generation times differ. Now, again, that should be pretty obvious, right? Eukaryotes takes us a long time to reach an uh, age in which we can reproduce. And um, we don't typically produce a lot of offspring. We're not going to produce thousands of children, OK, from one couple. Uh, that's not going to happen. But prokaryotes, wow, large and fast. You know, you start off with one bacteria, and you know, maybe a few hours later, you could have 10,000 bacteria. So they can have a lot of offspring. So we say that bacteria can pay the cost of mutation. Now, what does that mean? Well, let's say you start with 1,000 bacteria. And 900, 900, no, 999 of them develop mutations that do not allow them to adapt in this harsh environment that they're in. But one does. It's great. That's all you need. Okay? And that bacteria will survive and reproduce and replenish to a population of 1,000, probably in a very short period of time. Not a big deal. What happens if you have 1,000 humans and 999 of them die okay, because they can't adapt? Oh, you're gone extinct, okay? Um, 
that one person, because we depend on sexual reproduction, isn't going to be able to reproduce with anyone. So that's it. There isn't any more. But we can't pay that cost because we have such few offspring and it, our generation times are very long. Bacteria can because they, they can pay that cost. It's okay. If, all of them, if most of them die, not a big deal. They can replenish very, very quickly. We can't pay the cost. Okay, one more thing here is cellularity differs. Now, what does that mean? Well, eukaryotes are multicellular. They have made up of lots of different cells, and mutations there have to affect multiple cells at many different levels. You know, if you have a mutation in one cell, well, it has to, you know, maybe it's probably going to have to be in many other cells. It can't just be in one cell. And that's going to have to affect the tissue, which affects the organ, which affects the organ system, which affects the individual. There's lots of layers to go through, shall we say, before the individual individual has a change that can be either selected for or against in the environment. Most mutations simply don't do that. They don't make those kinds of changes. They can't get out, so to speak. They can't show themselves. But in prokaryotes, they have one cell. And so mutations only need to affect one cell, and that's it. And they will show themselves very, very quickly. Whether that's a good thing or a bad thing will be determined very fast. So mutations and natural selection have very different effects on prokaryotes than eukaryotes. So it's not valid then to say, well, what's true here is also true for us. That must be how it works with us. No, because they're very different organisms. You know, Jacques Monod is a famous biologist that said this, anything found to be true of E. coli must also be true of elephants. Okay, um, they're slightly different. Okay? Um, they share some metabolic similarities, I'll give you that. But they are very different organisms. And when it comes to the effects of mutation and natural selection, we see that even more. Um, we see that what they can and cannot do, they're very different. And that's, why back, that's one reason why bacteria are not good model organisms for evolutionary biology. But yet, bacteria and the changes they undergo are heralded as examples of evolution in action. I've seen your children's and grandchildren's textbooks. I know what they use. And they will talk about antibiotic, you know, antibiotic resistance and how it's developed in bacteria and how, wow, that's an example of evolution in action. You see it in the media all the time. That is not evolution in action. That is adaptation in action. But it's not one kind of organism going to another kind. It's absolutely not that. So in Another reason why they're not good models, and I could go through lots of these, but these are just three that I picked out, is adaptive mutations. Now, what is an adaptive mutation? Um, this is something that's basically non-random. Right? This is a non-random mutation, not like random mutations that evolutionists commonly talk about. This is non-random. Um, they occur in non-dividing or very slowly dividing cells that have been put in sort of a uh, a stressful change or die environment. They're under selection for one thing. So basically, you take the bacteria and you give them one food source. You say, okay, bacteria, here's, here's some sugar, here's some lactose. Deal with it. Metabolize it or die. That's what you're telling them to do. They either have to be able to break it down or they're going to die. So that's the situation that, you, that you've put them in by, by doing this, you know, by just growing them with one sugar. You're only going to give them one thing to survive, to survive off of. So they've got, they've got to basically, something either has to change in them or they're going to die if they don't have that ability to break down that sugar in the first place. Now, what happens? Well, they'll do that, okay? Many, many, many times they will produce the ability to break down that particular sugar. But only, um, in, but again, it's specific in relationship to the environment. It's not random. They're not just making changes to break down every sugar that's out there. They're making changes to break down that sugar that they're being presented with and only that sugar. Very, very specific relationship that happens there. Sometimes you hear this called directed mutation. Adaptive mutation, directed mutation. And it really flies in the face of evolutionary models of the randomness of mutation and random with respect to environment. They would never, they would have a hard time saying that non-random mutations have somehow led from molecules to man because that just doesn't work because that's, that's not what's happening here. So I want to share with you a few quotes. 
um, dealing with evolution and the idea of evolution and um, this random mutation. The mechanisms of evolution, like natural selection and genetic drift, work with the random variation generated by mutation. Factors in the environment are thought to influence the rate of mutation, but are not generally thought to influence the direction of mutation. So they might affect the rate, but they don't change what mutates and how it mutates and, and what it does, okay? It, it's completely random. For example, exposure to harmful chemicals may increase the mutation rate, but it won't cause more mutations that make the organisms resistant to those chemicals. In this respect, mutations are random. Whether a particular mutation happens or not is generally unrelated to how useful that mutation would be. So, completely random. How many times do we see the word random there, okay? It's random. It doesn't matter if it helps out in the environment or not. It's not, you know, directly in relationship to that particular environment. But, you know what? Yeah, a lot of bacteria actually do that. We do see a lot of non-random mutation happening. A lot of this directed or adaptive mutation, there's no doubt about it. The evidence is very clear on that. It is in relationship to environment, it is very specific. And um, when this was first coming out, um, Richard Lenski, who's a, a very famous, uh, very well-known microbiologist, had this to say. If the hypothesis of directed mutation is indeed correct, it has onerous implications for bacterial genetics, and in particular for the use of bacterial populations as model systems for the study of evolutionary processes. Okay? It's going to be a problem <laughs> if they do this. And uh, so we want to take a look at one of the very first experiments that actually showed the presence of these kind of mutations. How did they know this was going on? And this is E. coli, Escherichia coli, and the EBG gene. And we're going we're gonna to take this step by step here and not get too complex. E. coli is a bacteria that can metabolize lactose, that can break it down. It has genes called lac genes that let it do that. Okay? Now, you can have mutant E. coli which can't do that. Their genes are, in this case, and the bacteria they're using in this experiment have actually been taken away. At least some of those have been taken away. They can't break down lactose. They can't do it. Those genes are missing. So you then place them in an environment, or what they did was place them in an environment where they only gave them lactose to survive on. They said, well, we're taking away the genes. We're going to see what you can do. Okay? We're going to see if that bacteria can now get the ability to break down lactose. And lo and behold, it did. It developed the ability to metabolize lactose. Well, how did it do that? Those genes were missing. Oh. But, back, but E. coli also have genes called EBG genes. And those genes allowed it, the mutations occurred in those genes, which let it then break down lactose. Now, something that's very important to remember here, you have to remember this. The EBG genes were already there, okay? They're not new. They were already there in the original E. coli. And they already broke down lactose. Now, not very well. They did it very poorly. But they could do it a little bit. Okay, so the genes were already there, right? And the function was already there. Okay, keep that in mind. It was, it was merely enhanced through these mutations that allowed it to do it better. Now, that's a really cool feat that bacteria can do that. And there are a lot of examples out there of this. We find this more and more. I talked about them some um, in my genetics talk. God designed them with mechanisms that allow them to adapt to adverse environmental conditions. And they need that ability. I always say they can't come in from the rain. Okay? We can. Elephants can find shelter. You know, they can go somewhere. Bacteria are stuck, okay? They're not going to go anywhere, typically. They have to deal with the environmental condition. Um, they, they need that ability. They need that genetic flexibility. They need the ability to change in order to be able to survive. Now, what's really amazing about these experiments is that they didn't find a lot of other mutations in the bacteria. They only found the ones, mainly, that helped them deal with that condition, that helped them be able to break down lactose. And there's other cases that they've done like this where all they find are mutations in these bacteria that help them deal with that particular environment. It's very, very specific, very directed. And so, and again, it makes sense, right? Why would they want to make a lot of other mutations? Why not just make the one 
that helps them out, that's in relationship to their environment. Um, you know, it's, it's a preservation mechanism that we're seeing, um, not this random thing that really, really wouldn't be helpful um, all that much. So it's not random chance mutation that can do anything and everything, such as eating from bacteria to fish, rather very specific mutations that allow them to deal with specific conditions. Now, Dr. Ken Miller, he's a, a very well-known theistic evolutionist. He likes this experiment because you know what he thinks about it? He thinks that this shows you can produce complex systems from mutation and natural selection. Hmm. He says this, what happens if we step things up to the next level, asking evolutionary mechanisms to design a multi-part system, a system that in Behe, meaning Michael Behe of the intelligent design movement, Behe's terminology could, would be irreducibly complex. The most direct way to do this would be a true asset test by using the tools of molecular genetics to wipe out an existing multi-part system and then see if evolution can come to the rescue with a system to replace it. So he says, you know, take away its ability to utilize lactose like they did in this experiment. Take away those lactogenes and see if evolution can come to the rescue. Can it rescue those bacteria? So then he talks about that experiment that I just talked about and he says, no doubt about it, the evolution of biochemical systems, even complex multi-part ones, is explicable in terms of evolution. Be he is wrong. No, Dr. Miller is wrong, okay? The E. coli EBG experiment totally fails his true asset test. Why? What did I say about the EBG genes? Were they there in the first place? Yes. Did they already metabolize lactose? Yes. So how did evolution come to the rescue here? It didn't, okay? It doesn't pass his test. They were already there. They didn't get new genes with new function. You just tweaked old genes that already had that function. It's just enhanced. It's just gotten a little bit better. It's not anything new. And really, how does this work for molecules to man evolution? Okay, they used to metabolize lactose. We took that away. Then they gained another way to, to metabolize lactose. So they regained something they lost. That doesn't get you anywhere. That just keeps you on an even keel, okay? You gotta add new systems and new functions to be able to move from molecules to man, not just regaining something you previously lost, okay? That doesn't move you anywhere. That's not gonna help you. Um, it's a horizontal movement, not a vertical movement, right? It's still a bacteria. It's still, um, you know, just a modification or an adaptation um, within that, not something new, not even moving in that direction. You're just altering something that already had a pre-existing system to fit the environment that it's in. So that's the problem with adaptive mutation for molecules to man evolution. It may not be random, it may be specific to the environment, and it leads to limited genetic and phenotypic change. You're not talking drastic changes, right? It regains something it previously had. Now, a great example of this, of how limited the changes are and what can happen, the scientist actually did these original experiments, decided he was gonna try another, another uh, experiment with these adaptive mutations. So he took the bacteria. Not only did he take away the LAC genes, but he took away the EBG genes. He took away both. And he said, oh, I, I'm, I'm pretty sure, he published a paper on this, I'm pretty sure the bacteria are going to develop the ability to utilize lactose. You know what he found? Nothing. The bacteria died. Okay? <laughs> they couldn't do it because there wasn't anything in their system that they could tweak, so to speak, um, to get to work to break down lactose. They died. And so, again, it's limited in what you can do with these mutations. It's very limited. And these appear to be very, very common types of changes, which makes sense. Why would it make random changes that won't help it out? That may be detrimental. It wants to make specific changes in relationship to, speci to specific environments. Now, so adaptive mutation in the creation model, though, how do we use this in, in our model in understanding things? That, my, that bacteria were designed with the inherent ability to adapt to rapid and dramatic environmental changes, which provides what I like to term rigid flexibility. Now, what does that mean? And so I don't know if this will help, but highly regulated genetic versatility. They can change. They can, you know, modify. Their, their genomes can be modified to allow them to exist in lots of different environments. And if the condition changes tomorrow, they can deal with it. If it changes to something else the next day, they can deal with it. They're amazing organisms in that sense that God has created to allow them to do that. They creatively alter things they already have to help them do it. Now, sometimes they can't and they die, 
right? Sometimes that happens, but a lot of times they can. They have that flexibility. If you want more information on this, um, I wrote a paper along with Dr. Anderson of the Creation Research Society, and we presented that last year at the Sixth International Conference on Creationism. This paper is on the Answers in Genesis website, so if you um, put in the search under my name and maybe Barry Hall, um, because that's the scientist who did the original work, um, looking at these bacteria, it will come up. So you don't have to write down the whole title, just my name and Barry Hall, and it should come up, and you'll see that. Okay, one more thing as to why you know, they're not a good model for evolutionary biology, and that's the pan genome. What is the pan genome? Pan meaning wide. Um, denotes the set of all genes present in the genomes of a group of organisms. Now, let's give you an example here. For example, if in humans, the pan genome is about 20,000 genes. Because if you sequence my genome, and you sequence your genome, guess what? We'll have the same, we should have the same number of genes. We should have around 20,000 genes both. That, that's it, there's just 20,000 genes. That is not true for bacteria. And we didn't know this until a few years ago, so this is fairly new stuff. If you just sequence one bacteria, or even a few members of a bacterial species like E. coli, it's inadequate for determining the genes present in the species overall. Now remember, they have very small genomes, so you know what they do? But they still have lots of genes, they just spread it out. They spread it out in lots of different individual um, bacteria. Um, again, you and I would have similar number of genes. You take this bacteria and this bacteria, both E. coli, they have different sets of genes, different things. Uh, and so it's pretty amazing what, what they can do. This is a graph showing um, three different kinds of E. coli that were analyzed, okay? So they looked at a lab form, they looked at a, a form that causes a urinary tract infection, and another form that causes intestinal um, problems and disorders. And they found that there was a total number of 7,638 proteins encoded by the DNA. 7,000 proteins. Now, this is the really cool part. 3,000 of those were common to all three. They all had them. 900 were only in two out of three, and over 3,500 were only in one out of three. These are all E. coli, okay? All of them, all E. coli, but yet this bacteria, this lab form, had a thousand genes that this one didn't even have. It had a thousand different genes. And they keep sequencing these, and some of these bacteria, it's amazing, E. coli, um, at least the ones that, um, in this paper that I read about, they sequenced 20 different E. coli, like different strains, like those that cause different diseases, some that didn't cause disease. You know how many genes they came up with that these guys have? 18,000 genes. They're approaching the number of genes that we have in our body, only it's just spread out. They don't have it all in one organism or one individual. Now here's the other really cool fact about that. 11,000 of those genes are not found in any other bacteria. Now, think about that for a minute. If you take my DNA and compare it to a chimp DNA or dog DNA, we'll have, very, we'll have similar genes. We have, we're, we're all mammals, we have similar functions. You take a bacteria and do that, they'll be totally different. There won't, there's nothing else that like, there, like that out there. It's just in that bacteria. Think about the number of genes overall then that these bacteria all over the world must have. It's going to probably reach in the millions of genes that these organisms have, and nowhere in comparison to the number of genes that we have. But again, it's important. They've got to have that genetic flexibility and versatility. You have a flow of genes, so to speak, kind of in and out of bacteria. They can modify those genes, and it greatly increases their ability to adapt to these ever-changing environments. So that great genetic flexibility. We don't have it, okay? If you sequence my genome and your genome, it's gonna be very similar. We just don't have that flexibility and that versatility, so to speak, because we don't need it. Plain, simple, we don't need it. Um, and we don't exchange genetic information very readily. If I bump up against somebody here, we will not exchange genetic information, okay? Not gonna happen. Bacteria do that. They might, they might likely exchange information, though. Um, they can do that, but again, it helps them to be able to adapt to these um, different environments. So when we deal with mutation and natural selection, it has a big role then in the genetic composition of bacteria. It can decide, well, this gene will help, this gene won't, you know, maybe we need this gene. I mean, it's just amazing how they can have a role in that, but it's simply not applicable to other organisms. It just doesn't apply. They just don't, we just don't have that type of genetic versatility that the bacteria do. So again, are bacteria an appropriate model for evolutionary biology? No. 
They're not. And this is only three reasons. I could give you more. Um, we don't have time. But this is only three reasons why they're not good models. But I wanted to do this to show some of the amazing design features, though, that bacteria possess to adapt to their environments, that genetic flexibility, which makes them unique for most eukaryotes, and to expose some of the problems, again, with using the effects of mutation and natural selection on bacteria as examples of evolution in action in support of molecules to man evolution. It doesn't work. Um, there's some Simply a huge, huge difference there. But why should we study bacteria from a creationist perspective? Because they are important to study. They're created and designed by God, and they were originally very good. They're designed to work with us in a free living state and in symbiotic relationships, as we explored earlier. So it's really important to understand the natural world better and our effects on it, how we're affecting it, and how we can take advantage of some of the roles that these bacteria have. For example, bioremediation. Bio -remediation, and helping the, ba the bacteria helping us clean up, so to speak. But in a post-fall world, it is a fact that some do cause disease. Some are pathogenic. And that's one area of microbiology, creation microbiology, that I'm specifically interested in, because I've had this question a lot. How do bacteria become disease-causing, you know? Um, pathogenic mechanisms that bacteria use are extremely specific and extremely complex. Very, very complex thing. But we know pathogenic bacteria didn't exist until after the fall. I mean, they weren't there in the original creation. We also know that mutations and natural selection can't form complex systems, right? They're very limited in what they can do. They can't add things. So then how did they get pathogenic? That's a big question. How do creationists account for the formation sorry, of complex pathogenic mechanisms after the fall? But we can account for that. And uh, one of the models that I'm working on and proposing is that no intentional pathogenic mechanisms exist. They weren't created to be pathogenic, but they were originally very good. But as a result of the fall, have become pathogenic. And we see indications of that in today's fallen world because, interestingly enough, the differences between pathogenic mechanisms that disease-causing bacteria use and symbiotic mechanisms that symbiotic bacteria do are very, very similar. From the analysis of the genetic and regulatory mechanisms of pathogenic and symbiotic interaction, no obvious distinguishing features are apparent. They're not. They're using very, very similar things, but they accomplish something different. Some cause disease, some develop a symbiotic relationship, but they're using similar things to do that. Let me give you an example of that, um, of how things can be both good and bad, so to speak. The cholera toxin released from Vibrio cholera. Okay, everyone probably is familiar with that. Bad in humans. Okay? Causes secretion of water and ions into the intestine, which eventually leads to dehydration. Okay? Bad thing. But depends on where you look at, because it can also be a good thing. In aquatic organisms, actually, it regulates cellular activities and is involved in the degradation of chitin, which is the exoskeleton of a lot of aquatic invertebrates. It actually has a good function there. So it's not all bad. It depends on the context, right? Depends on where it's at, what it does, and whether it's helpful or whether it's not helpful. And, uh, you know, maybe originally this is what it was designed for. This was its a very good, okay, original function. And but as a result of the fall, um, somehow this bacteria has made its way into human beings. Either maybe it's changed um, or humans have changed. It's made its way. It can live there quite nicely now, but causes a lot of bad results for us as a, as, um, in dealing with that. If virulence correlates with the expression of virulence-related factors in pathogenic, but not in closely related non-pathogenic variants, okay, bear with me, I'll talk about this, the presence of identical genes in pathogenic and non-pathogenic variants of one species indicates that some of their encoded factors, so what he's saying here is, okay, you definitely have pathogens and non-pathogens, but sometimes when you look at those, and you know, you can have E. coli that's harmless and E. coli that's harmful, and you can have both. But when you look at their genes, they're actually really similar. I mean, some of the things that this pathogen is using to supposedly be pathogenic, this symbiotic one is using to be symbiotic. I mean, they're very, very similar is what he's saying here. So he says maybe we shouldn't think of them as being pathogen or pathogenic mechanisms. Maybe they contribute to the general adaptability, fitness, and competitiveness rather than being virulence traits or pathogenic traits. They're actually just helping the bacteria survive. Um, consequently, it depends on the niche or growth condition to show whether certain fitness factors can also promote virulence. It depends on the context. Now, where did we hear that before? 
with beneficial mutations, right? There are no such things. It depends on the, it, there are beneficial outcomes of mutations, but it depends on the environment, on the context. Some people refer to the genetic personality of bacteria. You know, what else is there that's going to cause it to be a pathogen or a non-pathogen? Now, there's no doubt about it, though. I mean, even though context may determine this, there's no doubt about it that pathogens do exist. So we want to look just real briefly at how they do become pathogenic after the fall. One way is they get mutations. That should be pretty obvious. Um, a lot of times pathogenic uh, bacteria will have mutations in regulatory genes, okay? So uh, a lot of genes are then messed up as a result of that, so you'll see that. It's very common. Um, sometimes you have mutations or other alterations in the host. Guess what? Not just like bacteria aren't perfect, neither are we, okay? Um, we've degenerated. Our genome has, has had effects um, as a result of mutation. We now age. We didn't originally in the very perfect original creation. Um, we get things like AIDS that destroy our immune system, and unfortunately, as a result of that, bacteria take advantage of that. So the host itself has become um, not able to deal with the relationship between the bacteria and the, and the host or the human anymore. But another one that I think is very interesting is the idea of displacement. And this causes bacteria to explore new environments that they were not originally designed to interact with. They get genetic alterations that allow them to move into a new environment, or they get put in the new environment and they make genetic alterations to survive there. They, make, they have mutations that help them survive. Um, like I said, talking about adaptive, they can do that. Uh, but they weren't originally designed to be there, but now they are. It's like Vibrio cholera, wasn't originally designed to be in a human being, but now it is, and it causes problems. And that can be due to a lot of different changes. The bacteria can change, the host can change, or the environment can change. Now, I want to talk about the environment because the Bible gives us a really good example of a major environmental change that caused a great deal of displacement, and that would be the flood, okay? Talk about displacement. <laughs> um, it had a major effect on the worldwide distribution of bacteria because everything is getting mixed together now that wasn't mixed together before. Bacteria from the deep are brought forth, brought forth to the surface with water. Uh, we also have, uh, you know, we've got bacteria on the mountaintops mixing with bacteria that were at sea level. You've got bacteria that were in fresh water mixing with bacteria that were in salt water. You've got those that are in the air coming down with the rain onto the earth, right? Huge mixing up of bacteria. You also got animals on the ark that are in very close quarters that maybe never in, in their, you know, life on earth weren't together, and now they are. So you talk about displacement, okay? They're being majorly displaced here and put in conditions they've never been put in before. And after the flood, you got a lot of new environments, caves, deserts, ice sheets, things that they've never seen before, but because God designed them with amazing genetic flexibility, they can, they can deal with that. Now, unfortunately, it has some bad side effects, so to speak, in us, okay? Yeah, they're adapting and they're dealing with their environment, but sometimes, as a result of that, it harms us. It's harmful to plants or animals. There's a side effect of pathogenicity. So the mixing of many different bacteria in the different environments causes changes. Yes, they adapt and survive, but with some, with some bad consequences for us as a result of that. And... Uh, you know, one of the things that's interesting is human lifespans dramatically decreased after the flood. You go from like 900 and some years to 464 years, the oldest recorded individual after the flood. Wow, that's a huge decrease. Now, that's a lot of factors that probably dealt with that, and uh, um, Dr. Minton and I wrote a chapter on that for New, for New Answers Book 2. But I think there's a good chance that there was a lot more pathogenic bacteria. They were simply, I mean, they all got mixed up, they all were dealing with new environments, and, and they were exploring new environments, and they had a bad result, unfortunately, in the end. We know that by the time of Moses, that pathogenic microbes were a problem. Um, there's a lot of sanitary regulations that God gave the Israelites to help protect them from such things. So they obviously were an issue by that time. So they're, they're kind of getting a bad rap. I mean, the poor bacteria, they're just trying to survive. <laughs> um, they can't help it. <laughs> if it also is bad for us in the long run, um, but they're just trying to deal with their environment. So all bacteria are, were created very good, and we no doubt about that, but due to the fall, some bacteria now cause disease. Current pathogenic mechanisms originally serve very good functions, but they've been altered such that, you know, again, that those very good functions have been altered such that now they do cause disease and they are harmful to us. Um, 
Changes in bacteria, host, the environment, and displacement have all led to bacterial pathogenicity. It's not just one thing. There's obviously a multitude of factors that have resulted in that. And pathogenicity, like I said, is kind of a side effect of adaptation and survival of bacteria in a fallen world. They're just trying to survive, you know? Um, but it's, it's bad for us. It has bad effects as a result of that. And if you want more information on this, um, I'm going to publish, uh, hope to publish a paper later this year in Answers Research Journal on bacterial pathogenicity, and I'm going to be presenting that next week at the microform. So this is some of my research, so you're seeing some new stuff here, and uh, I'll be writing. I have a paper written, um, just have to go through the final submission here to get it into Answers Research Journal. So the conclusions. Bacteria were created and designed to serve as an organosubstrate, as an intermediary between the physical environment and macroorganisms. Um, in the environment and in symbiotic relationships. Bacteria are not good model organisms for evolutionary biology. We went through just some of those reasons, but um, you know, mutation and natural selection just don't do the same things in bacteria versus human. But they are amazingly designed to adapt to their environment. Bacter and bacterial pathogenicity is due to the corruption of originally very good information. It was good, but it's been corrupted. So as we see, you know, when we start with God's word is truth in creation, we can understand when microbes were created, what they were created for, what has happened since the fall, all of those things, and the amazing genetic flexibility and versatility and adaptive features that God has designed these bacteria with. And we see, however, that if we start with man's ideas as truth, we start with the idea of evolution, then there's a lot of problems. Because bacteria are not good models for evolutionary biology. They only undergo very limited changes, and and not the types that lead from to molecules to man, and that they're incredibly complex creatures which defies their evolution by random chance mutation over millions of years. So that's just to give you a little bit, okay, on microbiology. Can't cover all of that in the time that we have, um, all of those different microbes, but they're truly amazing creatures um, that God has um, designed to live with us and to help us out.